So guys, welcome to Sleep TV. You know, thank God we're not in COVID days when we did this every day. And, and we're back to doing it on Tuesdays because I have a dear friend that called me one day and said, Ronnie, if you ever do it Wednesday again, delete my number. I don't, you're not allowed to do it on Wednesday. And I said, I love you. And you know what, we'll be on Tuesday. So Dr. Jeff Horvitz is the, the guy that <laughs> called me. And, you know, a lot of respect to Jeff. He's, he's you know, been a friend. Um, I, I just want to say a friend, you know, more than that, I don't have to say. Um, we have Dr. Kent Smith here. Um, became a really good friend. We talk at least three times a week and see each other. So, so that's awesome. You know, the leaders in dental sleep medicine. And, and when I say leader in sleep medicine is I say it only on people that I would send my kids to get treated with them. And you guys are definitely, you know, in that top 10, I've got a few and you guys are, are over there a hundred percent. And the reason I can't do Wednesdays is because there's dinks and Jeff later on just mention it because I think it's a, great educational platform. I think it's just going to grow and grow and grow and, and dentists need a good place to go and learn and have fun. Um, so talk about that. Thanks, and I Ron. appreciate your time. You guys did ADSM. You spoke about technology, um, different stuff. It was great panels, a lot of great questions. And uh, we, we got a lot of people asking us about it. So this is a great platform to talk about technology um, it's not just about our technology. I think it's the whole digital flow in, in dental sleep medicine. Um, you know, as we move forward, more and more technology helps the offices. So that's it. John Nato, that's been, you know, my partner for, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years. It's been a long time. Um, I'll give you, let you talk, introduce everybody. And I'm going to probably be out because I can't add a lot to this. So appreciate your guys' time and friendship and everything you do for the industry. Thank you, Ronnie. Well, thank you, Ronnie. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much to, uh, to Dr. Smith and Dr. Horowitz for joining us tonight. I, I kind of texted them last week real quick and I was like, hey, guys, we had such great momentum and you know, this, we've all been, all, all of us anyway, have been to the ADSM meeting for, I don't even know how long, but at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's remarkable to see how it's changed, uh, especially around kind of not, I don't say embracing yet, but, uh, but at least being open to different techniques and technology. And, and this year, you know, everybody knows SGS, you know, our product, the EchoVision pharyngometer, rhinometer. And, you know, I've been working with that since, since it was really first introduced in, in dental. And, and uh, it's, it's amazing to see how we've come from, you know, this, this kind of little, this little side business, this little thing that, that nobody really respected or understood, or, you know, I think that was a big problem is it wasn't understood. Um, to now something where there was three or four lectures here at this, this past ADSM where people were talking about it. It was a point of discussion. It was a, uh, you know, kind of a featured thing. Uh, and that, that's remarkable. I've never, uh, uh, just, it was awesome to see that grow. So I wanted to do a follow-up to that tonight, if we could, is just kind of recap what we talked about, what was discussed, um, you know, for those of you that didn't attend or, or couldn't catch the lecture, because I know there's more than one going on at once, um, you know, kind of a good idea to, to, to recap, just make an open forum. We've got a few slides to chew through, but then it's just, it's just chatting uh, because I think these guys here, you know, have certainly have a, a, an unbelievable perspective on it, you know, where, where both of you were doing sleep without an echo vision for a long time. Um, and I think that's a cool, maybe that's a good place to start is, you know, what happened? There was this, uh, at some point, a light bulb moment where it's like, hey, maybe this does have a place in my, my protocol. And, and, you know, now people say, hey, I, I wouldn't do it without it. So I'll pass it off. I guess that's a, I think that's a cool way to open and then we can pull up some slides. Are we going to pull up slides or answer can, the Sure, I'll do that. I'll pull up while you guys are talking. Yeah, I can tell you, my wife knows I'm a born skeptic, and 
for years, I just, it didn't make sense to me. Um, I even talked against it in my seminars and I just, uh, I just didn't see the point. And, but honestly, I had blinders on. I was just using influence of other people to say those things. And that was a mistake because when I finally decided it was time and we'll get into that later, what led me to that. But yeah, I, I, now I can't believe I practiced that many years without it, but I did, I made it. I still, made it. still practiced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and for me, it was, uh, you know, I'd been doing this in, in one form or another really since, since the nineties, since I started learning how to take care of kids and how to grow airways and kids. And then, you know, it became a real thing with adults and, you know, it was one thing to be so passionate about it, but it was another thing to be efficient at it and also be able to make a living doing it. And, and that was really my, my biggest struggle in, in sleep was how do we make this a part of practice that can also be profitable like general dentistry can, because this is where, you know, this is where my true passion has been, has been in TMJ and ortho and sleep. And yet that was probably the toughest area to make a living, you know, in, in practice. So um, for me, it was, it, there just happened to be a course in my backyard and I'd been doing it for a while and John happened to be teaching there. And, and like you can, I was, uh, I was kind of skeptical as well, but I also knew I wasn't making a great living doing what I was passionate about. So first day went by and it was a lot of science. I'm like, ah, this is a beginner's course. And then that night I took a sleep study that uh, next day um, did some pharyngometry, made an appliance uh, with the with the pharyngometry metrics, and uh, and I was a believer, and and I understood that in anything dental that we do, whether it's sleep or TMJ, you gotta have good systems, and you know this is just another tool in what can be an amazing system. Well, I, I remember that course. Yeah. And I was like, I hope this guy, I remember, I remember thinking, all right, this guy's not a newbie. I hope he doesn't heckle too bad. And like, you know, just, just, you know, throw, try to throw some curveballs and, and, uh, but no, that was, that was the start. And I'm of pretty that. sure Auburn and, Al or Auburn and Alabama were playing that day too. So, and, and <laughs> South Carolina had played earlier. So it was a pretty tough day to keep my eyes off the, uh, off the iPad, <laughs> but we managed. That was that was good, and and it's it was the start of a, a great relationship. So that's awesome. I'm, I'm I don't know how you found the course. I'm glad it happened. And um, you know, back then the EchoVision did not look like it does today, and that's what I have on the screen here. It's just kind of the 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 growth that's happened. The rhinometer came out first. The pharyngometer was a few years after that. It used to be this old DOS system. I mean, DOS isn't a floppy disk DOS. That's how it ran um, with this big boxy industrial computer looking thing. And, and uh, um, you know, I had a lot of dentists tell me back then, this is the ugliest piece of technology I've ever seen. And, and I, I think it's cool, but I, I don't want to put it in my office next to my cool lasers and CERAC and cone beam and all this stuff. Like, it, this is not going to fit. Um, we, we took that to heart and really invested a lot in, in rebuilding the system and, and redoing it from the ground up. So in 2019, we launched that, the, the new EchoVision, the new pharyngometer, rhinometer. And while the science behind it's the same, it's still acoustic reflection, it's still acoustic geometric imaging of the airway, because that's what it does, right? It's, a, it's identifying size and stability of the airway um, and collapsibility, which you get to. But it's doing it in a, you know, a nice Windows 11 touchscreen PC that's, you know, has cloud backup and battery backup. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a much nicer, more modern piece of technology. So that's where we're at now. Um, you know, I always equate it. Now I'm going to give uh, uh, our, our clinical director, Jeff Harrison, some props because he always calls it the, the, the dental sleep medicine GPS, right? It's like, 
you got to know where you're going in order to get there, you know, and, and there's so much discussion about appliances and, and which one to make and when and why, and this one's better and that one's better. And, you, you know, go to the ADSM and there's 500 appliances there and everyone says it's the best one ever, but really, you know, the, the, what makes it work or not work is what it's, it's position, right? It's not whether it's made of the coolest, newest, thinnest, prettiest acrylic, it's where is it putting you? And is it putting you in a therapeutic position? Um, and so, you know, the, the, the pharyngometer, you know, for the layperson, I think that's what it does is it helps guide us to that and hopefully guides us there a lot quicker as opposed to, you know, you've got this map on the screen and I say, okay, go to 450 Main Street. And you're like, well, where the hell's Main Street? I don't even see it on here. Well, eventually, if you just drive around long enough, you might find Main Street, you know, you might get there. Uh, but it will be much better to have some sort of guide that takes you there. Hey, um, hey, John. Yeah. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, start halfway there, four blocks over. <laughs> halfway there, four blocks over. So that's a uh, that's our that's our George Gage analogy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's true. I mean, that's you know, forever, I mean, I say forever, even now today, that's, that's, you know, what's being, that's what's being taught, right? Every person with every mouth, with every airway and every height, weight, whatever, every, you know, occlusal classification, everything, everybody starts this much open and this much forward. And that's it. That's that. You know, uh, to me, that's just crazy, you know, and, and why not measure? Right. What else do you do in dentistry that you don't measure? You know, so I think I, I think that, you know, really, really hammers home a, a key point. And then the other point, and, and I think Jerry Hu and John Camisi did a great job with this article to talk about vertical, because, again, traveling around the ADSM. What do people say? If you go talk to a, a, a sleep dentist and say, okay, you've tried everything, right? You've cranked them forward, backwards, sideways, upside down, and, and you're not getting an ideal result. Then what do you do? What do they tell you? I had vertical. What if you just did that first? If that's what they needed, instead of wasting months and months of cranking screws and changing straps and bands and hooks and whatever else to get to a result that's not going to help. You know, if, if vertical helps, then why not measure and why not figure that out right away? To me, the biggest takeaway of this article that they published in the AGD journal was, was that they were able to get an ideal result, an optimal result with five millimeters less protrusion on average than the George Gage bike. So we got a better result and brought them less forward. Who doesn't want that? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the success rate was in the 80th percentile too, which, and, and that was across different levels of severity. So if you really take that apart and compare it to the overall success rates shown throughout all the other literature, I think this was really a, an incredible paper. Um, and I think it's just the beginning of what we're going to see as more studies come out. And, you know, obviously the no titration part was key. You know, that's, right. I, I have a lot of people ask, how do we, I mean, and it was your opening statement, Jeff, how do I be profitable with this? How to be more profitable with this? You know, and I think, you know, Kent can certainly speak to that because he's, I mean, he's done an <laughs> unreal job in, you know, in his practice there, but also how to be more profitable be more efficient with your time, right? If you see them less and there's less chair time and less playing, that's going to inherently increase profit, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a statistics guy, obviously. I have, I think at last count, over 100 Excel spreadsheets that we're using to track everything <laughs> you can think that's of. And I have an Excel spreadsheet queen in my office, and I'm not going to tell you her name because you might steal her, but... <laughs> Anytime I want whatever stats run, she'll do it. And usually within five minutes, she's got answers for me. So I did ask her. Um, so I looked, I've had the pharyngometer now. I got it when it got off a of DOS. I said, okay, now I'm ready to get this thing. But it, 
the reason I decided, honestly, was the first reason was because Brady Billing, my billing company, told me, hey, doctors are making money off of this. They're, we're billing, we're getting paid. You can probably pay for this if you get it. And I said, okay. Then I started looking at other things. And <laughs> I'm all about technology, but I need to see the ROI on it before I invest in it because I've done too many things without that. So I had her run 33 months I've had it and I had her run the 33 months before and the 33 months after. And I said, can you tell me what the average number of follow-ups per appliance is for the 33 months before and 33 months after? And it went from 2.28 down to 1.73. So that's a 23% reduction in number of follow-up visits per appliance. And you could look at that different ways. You could say, well, gosh, we make money when they come back in for a follow-up visit. Well, that's true if you can actually bill for it, but with Medicare and some other plans, you might not get that much and you can't bill within the 90. In fact, you're not even supposed to bill for five years with Medicare, as the Medicare folks tell us. So, but, but that's just part of it because then I had her, well, I had my office manager tell me, okay, since we've had the pharyngometer and rhinometer, how much income has it brought in? And in the last two and a half years, it was it's 72,300 for the pharyngometer and $52,286 for the rhinometer. So those are just billing those codes. So that's right at about 125,000 or about $50,000 a year that we've cleared. I mean, there's, there's very little cost once you you get the equipment. So it's, it's clearing 50,000 a year. So it's kind of a no brainer financially. It totally makes sense. And that's even if it doesn't help you, even if it doesn't help you get to the end point faster. Right. And on top Which of that, it sounds like it is. The, the so. tech, the patients love the technology too. Yeah. I mean, you got to admit all patients love technology. They think, you know, more than the last guy they saw. So, you know, I, I had three reasons to do this. And mm -hmm. Well worth it. I, um, <clears throat> and I think the, you know, another, I guess if we're making those points, kind of the, the, the why points, and, and you guys can speak to this. I mean, I, I know, Kent, in your practice, you know, they come in for a consult and patients are worked through all these stations so that even prior to seeing a doctor, they've had, numerous workups done. So you've got a complete set of info on everybody. Um, but one, I think they like the technology and hopefully if we're doing it, you know, the way we'll, we'll show and talk about it here in a slide or two, but if we can show somebody, and this is probably a harder metric to measure, but you know, if I'm a patient and, and a natural skeptic too, and you, you have those, um, if, if you can show them that they respond, you know, if you can show them that, Hey, look, this isn't a guess anymore. I know if I put you here, your airway is blowing up. This is a home run. You know, that, that's going to hopefully create a lot more excitement around your proposed therapy, you know, even prior to them saying yes. So I, I I'd love to see data looking back. Maybe we can dive into spreadsheets on case acceptance. You know, if, if more people say yes, if you can show, so I, I hear you asking for a spreadsheet. Okay. You know how to do so that. <laughs> you didn't know that I had this statistic. I didn't tell you I had this statistic, but we I seriously didn't know. Yeah. We have measured for, for years. So it's a, it's a funnel, right? So you've got leads that come in from, yep. from doctors, from, from your website, from walk-ins, from your dental practice, whatever. Leads then how many of those leads turn into being scheduled? Okay, so then the funnel gets a little smaller. Yep. How many of those scheduled patients actually show up? All right, so then there's some no-shows. And then of those that show up, how, my, how many actually move forward with treatment? So it's that last number that we measure. If they showed up, how often do they go forward with treatment? So for that same 33 month period before and after, I asked her to run the conversion rate at that, that last part of the funnel and it's gone up 
Now, 6% may not seem like that much, but if you think about it for 100, every 100 appliances you do, that's six more appliances. We average about $3,800 per appliance. So it, it adds up, believe me. So you, you said a couple of things, Kent, that, that first of all, um, the fact that prior to pharyngometry, you were at two point something follow-up visits is a testament to how long you've been doing this and, and how you've gotten your systems down because I never got to that point where I could get it to less than three follow-up visits prior to having pharyngometry. I can tell you that our follow-up visits were cut in half when, I mean, immediately. And then to be able to get to a point of maybe just one appointment follow-up, I mean, th th there's just nothing else that increases efficiency in that way. So when I look at technology, it's, you know, of course, the first thing you look at is, am I going to get an ROI on this, right? But that's not the be all end all for me. If there's a product that may break even or maybe even cost me a little bit monetarily, but it increases positive outcomes for the patient and myself and reduces negative outcomes for the patient and our team. So what's a positive outcome for the patient? They get treated efficiently, quickly and successfully. Positive for the dentist means it didn't take them 20 visits to where they couldn't make any money on the case. What are negative outcomes for the patient? Oh, guess what? You weren't really a good candidate for appliance therapy. Gee, doc, I wish you'd have told me that before we got started or at least laid a foundation that this might not be the best treatment for you. So, I want less doubt from the patient and certainly a negative outcome for the dentist is, you know, seeing them 10,000 times and like, I've just lost a, a, a ton of money on this case. So as long as technology makes treatment more efficient, more predictable, creates happier patients, increases efficiency in the office, I think that that money comes back maybe in an intangible way or, or less tangible way, I should say. Mm -hmm. I, I agree completely. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, one tangible way is it, it's really hard to know how, how the experience of the patient translates to them then writing reviews, telling their buddies about it, referring in their friends and family and coworkers. But I can tell you that before pharyngo since I got pharyngometer, we're now making twice as many appliances that we were before. So I don't know all the stuff that went into that, but I know that we're more productive since we added that to our, in fact, it took me about a few months before I decided I needed a second pharyngometer. Love it. Well, John, we interrupted your, your slide presentation. No, it's okay. That, this was my, I, honestly, like, you know, on a, on a webinar with especially the three of us, we don't even need slides. We could probably just, sit here and, and, and ramble. But um, I always like to show this one when we're talking about pharyngometry because these are the, you know, when the, the historical, I don't say rebuttals, but questions that everybody has, you know, and, and kind of for the lay person or for the one, for somebody that's not experienced it, not tested with it, I could see where that's, hey, you're, you're measuring somebody sitting up in a chair. How does that correlate to what happens at, at night? And I totally get it right? Why are you testing them upright versus supine? You could certainly, you know, fully recline them in your, you know, in your operatory and test them, you know, in a supine position. Wouldn't that be more, uh, more accurate? Uh, so the, the upright versus awake thing, you know, I think it really, or the awake versus asleep thing, you know, it, it goes back to, and, and, some of us that have been in sleep a long time remember, you know, my original boss and, and mentor, Dr. Spiegel, Ed Spiegel, and, and he was really instrumental in bringing this to, to dentistry. Um, and I remember one of the ways he used to teach it is he used to say on a pharyngometer, oh, this is your daytime airway and this is your nighttime airway. And so people were like, well, wait a second. No, 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 that can't be your nighttime airway. It's not nighttime. That, that's impossible. 
Um, and really what it's, you know, that was a, that was a way to get people and patients maybe to understand it a little better. But what we're looking at is not a day versus night airway. There's no way to image your airway with a pharyngometer, what's happening at night. I get it. What we can see is compliance and collapsibility. And that's, I mean, collapsibility in an airway is the mechanism by which we have sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea. People with stable airways don't have OSA. Uh, people with unstable airways do. And we can see that that dynamic change, right? That flexibility, which is why imaging like this is more viable, certainly, than something like cone beam, which is a snapshot. It can see a picture of an airway. It can see whether it's big or small, but what it can't see is that flexibility in the tissue. That's what we could see with pharyngometry. And we know that when you have a highly compliant, collapsible airway while you're sitting up awake in a chair being tested, that same collapsible airway stays with you at night when you go to bed and it collapses and it chokes you and that's why you have apnea. We also know if we can make that collapse go away, that improvement goes, goes to bed with you as well. So it's not so much about saying this is exactly how big an airway gets while you're sleeping, it's mitigating collapse. And we know that that translates and all the research shows that that translates to nighttime. So that's the, the upright, or that's the awake versus the sleep thing. And then upright versus supine, you know, I always, you know, anybody in dental has experienced this as you have a, a patient in a supine position and you're just wrestling with their tongue, right? Because they're protecting that airway. They're unconsciously protecting it. So the reason we don't test people in a in a supine position is because they will unconsciously activate muscles, thrust the tongue, advance the mandible. They'll do things to protect their airway from collapse, which is precisely what we're trying to get it to do. Um, so you're fighting with them the whole time. Uh, when they're upright, they don't have that same propensity to protect airway. And so you get a cleaner, more reproducible test. Uh, and, and that's why we do it that way. So hopefully those kind of clear those two big questions up. I mean, they get asked all the time. You know, John, um, I would add to that too. Uh, th there have been so many studies done on, on the positional part of pharyngometry. And um, what, what was found in most of them, you know, there were some that said how reproducible it was when you were standing up in the mirrored position, how reproducible it was when you were in the sitting position. Um, what we learned also is that, yeah, it can be a little bit worse un when they're uh, supine mm -hmm. unless they're protecting their airway, which patients were shown to do. Mm -hmm. So once something becomes non-reproducible, I think that becomes a place where we need to say, maybe that's not the data we need because none of the data that we're getting is exact to what's happening at night. This is all correlation. This is all a tool. How collapsible is it? About where are they collapsing? What are my chances of, uh, of seeing some kind of successful outcome by treating this patient with oral appliance therapy? So by and large, where we got the most reproducibility was in that seated position and just do it the same way every time, regardless, they were all pretty reproducible, except for the patient that was lying down based on whether they were protecting their airway or not. And even then it was still pretty darn reproducible. Yep, yep. I agree. I've seen it a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we already kind of talked about titration and, and this kind of you know, the, the flying blind approach and, you know, <laughs> the, the putting everybody in the same position and, you know, then going from there and seeing what happens. I always, in our, in our bigger lectures, I always equate it to like shoes, right? The average shoe size for US men is a 10 and a half. So that would be like, you go to the store and everybody, no matter who you are and how big your feet are, you're getting a 10 and a half shoe. You either got to wedge your giant ass feet in there or you're going to just be swimming in that 10 and a half, but everyone's getting the same thing. We don't measure your feet to see what you need. We're all putting the same size shoe on. And then, you know what, if it's, if it's too small, 
you know, if it's too small, we're going to go to 10 and a half to an 11, you know, and then 11, 11 to an 11 and a half. And we're eventually going to maybe get one that fits or the same thing in reverse. It's just such an inefficient system. You know, hopefully we can measure it and do it right from, from day one. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's huge. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into like graphs and, and, you know, reading a pharyngometer report or any of that stuff right now. Um, you know, that's not, that's not for tonight. Um, what I would say is anybody that's intrigued by this, certainly if you heard uh, Dr. Smith's lecture or Hor uh, Dr. Horowitz's lecture uh, at, at ADSM or, or a couple of the other ones that talked about it, John Carollo did a great one, talked about it. Um, so if, uh, if you want to learn more or see you know, and maybe, I don't know if Faustina's listening or she can put it in the chat, but if you want to learn more about this, see what it might look like in your practice, see, see how it's going to fit in your flow. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this follow-up tonight, because I think it, it just, it makes, you know, it makes sense. We can come in and we'll go through all those graphs and all that data. You know, you'll understand this. It's just tonight's not the time to do it. Um, well, it was, what I will say is our software has improved a lot over those early generations, and we now have reports and things that can be printed and shared with sleep physicians and all that stuff, and, and I think that's, that's certainly powerful. Um, you know, again, as, you know, as, as Kent was saying, it, it kind of sets you apart, too, from the other guy down the street that, you know, the sleep patient comes in and they take the little George gauge bite, they don't do any imaging or scans or measurements or tests, and and, you know, this is, you know, part of, not everything, but it's part of a pretty comprehensive exam. Well, it's a confidence builder for the patient, not, not just, wow, look at the technology, but beyond that, what are they learning about themselves? Oh, wait a minute. The distance between those two lines is how collapsible my airway is. You've just educated a patient in 30 seconds and, and what would have taken you, you know, five, 10 minutes to really explain. And they go, oh my gosh, we need to fix that. It's like when you put the big x-ray on the screen and, you know, and they can see the bombed out area of decay. They're like, okay, how do we fix it? Gotta, you know, they ask it. you. No, I think setting that expectation. I mean, it's, it's the, you know, it's the inner camera analogy, right? As you show them what's broken and you don't have to offer a fix, they're gonna, they're gonna desire it. You know, if you show somebody a broken bone, they wanna make it better. You show them a broken airway, they're gonna wanna improve it. And I think working through stuff like this with the, the airway metrics jigs helps you get there too, right? So you can now, you know, if, and again, for those of you that haven't seen this, these little bite jigs are, kind of our tool for, for testing response to different positions, right? This is trying on an appliance before you buy it is the best way I can describe it, right? Different verticals, different horizontal positions. You know, the jig holds you there long enough to run a test and see how that airway responds. So, you know, when, um, you know, when Kent, when you come in the room, for you know, for a patient that's already been tested, I, I'm assuming they've been run through five, six of these positions prior to you even seeing them, right? Yeah, yeah and I, I was going to mention that this is assistant-based sleep. I mean, I can't yeah. even tell you the last time I actually worked on the pharyngometer. All my assistants know how to do it, and you know they they really love doing it. They love all the technology. It just makes them feel more worthwhile. Makes them feel like they're part of the whole process rather than just passing the, the patient off to the dentist. They've been a part of figuring out exactly where to start that patient and what the airway looks like and how compliant or non-compliant it is. I'm, uh, I'm just reading, I'm, I'm trying to catch up in some of the chats that we have going to, to see if, if there's any questions, what I was, I should have said it earlier, but if anybody does have questions, throw it out there. Um, you know, throw it in the chat for sure. Um, the last thing I wanted to show, and then Jeff, you have some, do you have some stuff you want to, to, to throw up there? 
Yeah, I've got a okay. I've got a few slides. I'm okay. I'm trying to pull some of the stuff out now that that you've already covered. Um, but yeah, I've got a I've got a few things I can kind of throw cool. up there. Right. Um, I know Faustina is going to put a link in the chat and a link in the Facebook um, the Facebook Live uh, stream uh, for. <clears throat> trying to see if it's there now it's not there yet but she will put it here at the end uh where you'll have a you'll have a link to click through to request a consultation specifically for your practice a demonstration in your office a consult with one of our sleep coordinators uh just to you know to chat more and, and discuss your specific situation and needs and all that and actually get your hands on and do some testing because this is one thing to see a slide it's different to, to actually test and you know, be tested. Sorry, let me chime in real quick. The link is generating just another two minutes and I'll post it for everyone. Very good, thank you. Thanks. All right, I'll stop sharing this. Jeff, if you have some you want to share. Yeah, so um, there's still probably too many slides for, for what our purposes are tonight. So I may just um, I may just rattle through some of them if you don't mind me Fine. if you don't mind me fast forwarding a little Do bit. It. Let's see here. And whoop, that's not the right one. Hang on. This is what happens when you work with too many screens, guys. <laughs> so, and I lost my screen share. Hang on. Uh, give me just a second. Talk amongst yourselves, guys. <laughs> well, this is the lecture that was on the main stage at the ADSM a couple weeks ago. So. Are you um, are you seeing it or not? I'm seeing the like the slide sorter, like the you know the little pictures. Are you okay? All yeah. right, so I'm just making sure we got the right thing up. There we go. There we go. You got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this. I mean, first of all, this this lecture was was way overdue at ADSM. Um, you know, it's it's something that when people don't embrace certain technologies not only do they not i think that that they will at times try to disprove it to make themselves feel better about not investing in the technology and um you know we can prove or disprove anything we want in the literature and you know the most amazing thing to me about doing a lot of research on on pharyngometry and as a past scientific advisor at the Koi Center, you know you can't stand up in front of that group and and not be based in in science and data. And so you know I've had the opportunity to do a lot of research on this, and what was amazing to me were how many articles there were that supported the use of pharyngometry way disproportional to the number that were against its use for dental sleep medicine and in those studies that i found that were against its use in dental sleep medicine they weren't comparing apples to apples they almost had to make strange assertions in order to disprove the technology. And so that's kind of what I wanted to do in this lecture was, was to show how the preponderance of evidence says that this can be an extremely useful tool for us, how it does correlate with CBCT, except for the fact that you have a static image in a CBCT and ionizing radiation where you don't have that and you're looking at a dynamic structure. So, you know, I, I just wanted to get some of these points across and that that really this is not a be all end all. This is not an absolute. This is something that is really meant to be a tool. 
just like we use a Minnesota retractor when we're doing, you know, oral surgery to retract the cheek versus a mirror. There aren't that many studies, randomized controlled studies that say, okay, here's proving that the Minnesota retractor is better. It's just a tool that gets you to the end result faster, and we don't have any risk associated with it. So that's kind of where we are with pharyngometry. So I'm going to I'm going to bop through these pretty quickly. But, um, you know, the newest version of this, as John said, it's got software, it's got the pharyngometer and the rhinometer. Is the nasal airway good or isn't it? That's all I want to know if it's good press on. If it's bad, I'm going to make a referral to an ENT or find out why it's bad, possibly even an allergist. So once we get past rhinometry, then we're going to use pharyngometry to say, what is the, you know, what are the chances that you have OSA? What are some of the points of collapse of the airway? How collapsible is the airway? And then what are the chances of us having some kind of success in providing new appliance therapy and having at least a roadmap to start that process. So rhinometry, is it good? Is it bad? That's all I care about. I don't care about the numbers. This is a simple test. It can be done in one minute, literally. We're just gonna test each nostril to see if the nasal airway is patent or not. And again, this is a way that we mitigate risk. We can tell patients, look, you have a really bad nasal airway. We need to get you to an ENT if we want to maximize the results of appliance therapy. So we mitigate risk. We, we set realistic expectations. And that has been tremendous. So then in rhinometry, we're going to look at the oral airway. I want to see how bad does it collapse? Where is it normally? How bad does it collapse? Where does it collapse? And then what are the chances for success with oral appliance therapy? And can I find a position that supports you? So rhinometry, basically, we're just looking at three bell curves. Do they, do they go through the bell curves or are they below the bell curve? And if they're below the bell curve, then we've got a problem. So we get them to the ENT or the allergist. Real easy to see that they're below the bell curve here. So very, very simple. And that's as fast as that test needs to be. I mean, it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to be belabored any longer than that. Pharyngometry. Um, again, all I care about is what is the likelihood that you have apnea? Where is the collapsibility? How bad do you collapse? And is there a good possibility that I can fix this with oral appliance therapy? So we're setting expectations. Well, why do we need that if we have a CBCT? Well, as John said, a CBCT is just a snapshot. Is the patient breathing in? Is the patient breathing out? Is the patient's neck back? Is it forward? Are they sitting? Are they standing? Is their head tilted one way or the other? Did they have their bite all the way together or were they in CR or were they biting on a big thick tab? There are so many variables and all you're getting is the size of the airway, which doesn't really tell us a lot about collapsibility and what's happening in a dynamic airway. So if you wanted to try to capture that, you could, but it would be multiple scans and that makes absolutely no sense. So study after study, I mean, you can go through, do your own literature review. Anyone who wants to get in touch with me, I am happy to share this lecture in PDF format. John has it. Um, he'll be happy to share it as well. Study after study, and the list goes on and on about talking to you how the technique is suitable not only for measurements of static properties, but by virtue of, of its ability to look at the airway across different points and every two seconds, um, what we're finding out is that this is good at looking at the dynamic structures as they change during inspiration and during exhalation. It can be used in adults and it can be used in children. So uh, again, I don't have time to go through all these studies. Obviously, this is just a, a one hour discussion that we're having tonight. But, you know, comments like this, low cost, speed, 
simplicity of measurements, lack of radiation, um, and the fact that the correlation between uh, modalities of measuring the airway is really strong and that the pharyngometer is a valid tool to use for airway measurement when compared to CBCT ratings, uh, readings, excuse me, except without the ionizing radiation and in real time as the patient is breathing out and breathing in. Um, and we can watch it over those times. So there've been a few challenges to this over time, but this is what I really wanted to spend time calling attention to during that lecture at the AADSM. So um, one, of the, one of the great studies uh, came out, we call it the Rutgers study, came out in 2017, where uh, Ananthan talked about um, how we could correlate what we see in, in pharyngometry to CBCT. And that's absolutely true, except that we're seeing it over time. So we're really understanding what's happening in all situations in the airway versus just the snapshot that's being taken when you get into the CBCT. But um, in this second paper that he did, he talked about, for some reason, I'm not sure what happened politically there, and, and maybe there's some backstory there, but for some reason, or maybe it was you know just to be a good scientist, wanted to really look at uh, pharyngometry again. So he came back and wrote this paper um, saying that maybe it's not as good as we thought it was, but look how they had to do this and how they had to play with the wording to make this happen. And, and I think this is the key to everything that I've seen is, they have to play with the wording or play with what the end results are or what metrics are actually being looked at. So he talks about de Young having said that, um, that the minimum cross-sectional airway, which means everything to us in, in OSA, how that could be a significant predictor of moderate to severe OSA. But now listen to this. So de Young says, Minimum cross-sectional airway found by the pharyngometer is a significant predictor of moderate to severe apnea. And then he says, but contrary to that hypothesis, Friedman said that the cross-sectional airway measured by acoustic reflection is unreliable in predicting treatment outcomes. So in the first one, we're looking at predicting whether or not a patient is likely to have OSA. And then in the second one, they're saying, well, we don't know if this is gonna absolutely predict treatment outcomes. And that's the thing. We know it's a great negative predictor. So if you have a patient that completely does not respond to pharyngometry, then we tell them you may not be a great patient for this therapy there's a good chance you're a non-responder. I'd rather you spend your money on something that we know will treat you more effectively. And yet what they're saying is, well, we don't know how much better it's gonna get them. Well, we never know. But what we do know is that I have a better chance of getting them better if I can improve their pharyngometry statistics than if I can't. And, and that has been proven clinically by people like Dr. Ken Smith and, and, so, and Jerry Hugh and John Camisi and the people who've been using pharyngometry for so long. Um, another one looked at pharyngeal volume, which absolutely means nothing. Cross-sectional area, you know, that's, that's the smallest point in the airway. The volume is just an average of all those different cross-sectional areas. So if it's really small in one spot, and really big in another spot, you're gonna have a pretty decent volume, but the limiting factor is the smallest point, that minimum cross-sectional area. So I really want everyone out there to just look at some of these studies. Um, John Viviano, who uh, has really, uh, he has written so much supporting literature um, for acoustic pharyngometry, and more recently came out and, and wrote a paper about the velopharyngeal port and that it may not always be closed, that area right behind the nasopharynx. And if it's not completely closed, then your measurements might be a little bit bigger. I don't care. 
The thing is, <laughs> is it correlates. This is about correlation. Yeah. This is not about an exact number. And despite that issue with the velopharyngeal port, which is rarely a problem, it, it does not, it, it, it still correlates. If I can get them better with an open velopharyngeal port, I'm going to have better success. If I can't get them breathing better and I can't improve the minimum cross-sectional area with a closed velopharyngeal port, it doesn't and matter. You said it's it earlier a, too, the preponderance of evidence, right? The yeah. dominant amount of evidence is extremely supportive. And that's, a absolutely. That's and so this, this one anatomical you know, piece here that changes one of the numbers and and... It, it, it doesn't matter. That really has an effect on the volume, but really doesn't address the likelihood that we're going to be successful or whether or not we can improve the collapsibility for the patient. So, you know, I just, the whole point here is I just want everybody to not just read conclusions, but to read what is it that's being measured? Are we comparing apples to apples? And again, that, that this is really a tool. So, um, you know, we don't have time to go through all the graphs or anything. John showed you the airway metrics jigs. Mm -hmm. You know, rhinometry, is it good? Is it bad? It can be really fast. That's as long as it takes is what you just saw right there. Then we'll do a baseline and a collapse. Once we get them past that, we're gonna go through the airway metrics jigs and we're gonna find the best position for any given patient. So we're gonna look at vertical. We're gonna look at the AP movement. Where does this patient need to be? Because every patient, every single patient is gonna be different because they're all starting out with something different anatomically. It's like the size 10 shoe, right? It's as if we did root canals on lower second bicuspids, the average lower second bicuspid is 21 millimeters cusp tip to apex. How many of you feel comfortable filling every, you know, uh, taking the, uh, you know, debriding the pulp 21 millimeters and filling to 21 millimeters on every tooth and then saying, oh, well, we can adjust it if it's not working. No, those days are over and that's inefficiency at its finest. So um, anyway, what we know is the preponderance of the literature absolutely supports this. Again, don't have a lot of time to go through this. Here's, um, you know, this is an old case of mine that I used to show when I was teaching with, with SGS. Um, just a fella named Paul, this is where the rubber meets the road. Is this guy comes in, he's got a 48 AHI, spending 20% of the night under 90% oxygen, um, maximum heart rate 130 beats per minute, Average heart rate is in the 80s. These, these are all statistics that says this guy's sick. And yeah, he's going to have a really negative outcome. And the guy couldn't use CPAP. So we put him on the pharyngometer. I do his collapse. We go through all the airway metrics jigs, and I find the position that's going to treat him with the most efficacy. So I have a great starting point. It may not be my final point. I may have to tweak it. I may do pharyngometry again. But for the most part, this puts me in the zone pretty darn quickly. So we check his collapse. Then we find the position that improves the airway the most. We use those jigs that John showed you. And once we find that right position, this shows you how old the case is. This is still Aluax that we were using at this point with a dorsal <laughs> appliance. We take the bite. Now look at the amount of vertical in this. None of you using a George gauge are gonna ever start a patient with 10 millimeters of vertical opening, ever. And yet I knew right away that he needed to be more vertical and very little AP. Like you said in, in Jerry Hugh and John Camisi's um, paper, one of the things they talked about was that the average patient treated with the George gauge was at least four millimeters too far forward. Of, of from where they needed to be, which says a lot more side effects, a lot more negative outcomes. So, uh, you know, here's where he was before. We did not have one single titration appointment. Got the appliance, couldn't believe how great he felt. 
Um, we let him go another month just because we want all the inflammation in the airway to be resolved. Let him go another month, bring him back for a sleep study. We were done. AHI 8, time under 90% zero. Maximum heart rate goes from being 130 beats to, per minute to 80 something beats per minute. His um, average heart rate goes down into the 60s now. So, I mean, this guy is fixed with no titration appointments. That would have taken me, and, and Ken, again, I'm not as good as you. So that would have never, I would have never gotten that done in three appointments. He probably would have been a six to seven appointment patient at best. And now I was able to do it with one single follow-up, which was really just to find out how he was doing. So I always say it's that face you make the first time you hear rush. That is a great kind of day. <laughs> the big difference. I like it, man. Yeah. I like it. I'm getting big all difference the is just to... using pharyngometry and incorporating vertical. That's yeah. the big difference. So um, again, there's there's uh, Jerry Hugh and, and John Camisi's paper. But, you know, again, article after article after article supporting all of these things. Um, and the bottom line is this, guys. Do you need this? Do you have to have this to do sleep? Well, Kent is here telling you he did it for a long time without it. I'm here telling you I did it for a long time without it. Can you do it? Yes. Are you going to be as efficient? No. Are you going to be as profitable? No. Because this is a tool. This is not an absolute. This is just a tool to get you to the end point. You still need to use what's up here, right? You still have to make some decisions. You may have to tweak it. But like Ken said, he's down now to under two appointment follow-up. I'm probably a little higher than that, but I cut my follow-ups in half right away, like immediately. And you can't even sure. count how much money that is. I'm sure Ken can because he has a spreadsheet for it. But well, he's got a spreadsheet that tells him. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my I'm last all the uh, text to to say to to try to wrap up just because we 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 try we always try to keep we try to keep it under an hour, but an hour is kind of our I got job. you. Well, the, um, this is my last, this is my last one. slide. Okay. Good. So, you know, this, this was just my summary, um, which was really that, what are we getting with rhinometry and pharyngometry? One, we're getting data for a more comprehensive airway diagnosis, no. nasal sufficiency. <laughs> do I need an ENT consult? Which by the way, brings back um, referrals <laughs> from the ENT. And then we're seeing a dynamic versus a static image. Where is the problem? How bad is the problem? It also creates efficiency. It's a show and tell for patient education. It's fast, it's non-invasive, there is no risk. And that's the bottom line. If I, can, if I can implement a tool that brings no risk into the system for the doctor or for the patient, why wouldn't you implement this? That This is the part that I have a, a hard time understanding. You have immediate graphic data to help the patient understand, and you have immediate objective data to help guide your treatment. And then we can see, you know, is there a favorable or unfavorable prognosis? So is there improvement with the repositioning? The patient sees it you're going to have decreased patient time and you're going to be able to manage expectations really well. So um, that was uh, 70 slides in uh, 14 minutes or 13 minutes. minutes. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not too bad. But um, anyway, I, I always end everything with your beliefs. Don't make you a better person. It's your behavior that does. Um, and uh, as Ronnie mentioned, we, we do have a, a Facebook group called Dentists in the Know. We're on tomorrow night. We do a live show. We've had John on. Kent, we got to get you on soon. Um, you know, it's just a forum for great information and sharing. Uh, and, and the main thing is just that we're polite to each other. We, uh, we, we don't allow any bullying or or, you know, there's, there's really not a lot of room for ego in dentistry because uh, every time, you know, you let your ego get in the way, something bad happens in dentistry. So that's all I got, John. 
Thanks, sir. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Um, Kent, do you have any closings, closing stuff? <laughs> I appreciate it. Kent's still at the office. I'm home. Jeff's home. Ken's standing there in the office, so I I very and, much appreciate it. It's, it's, it's thunderstorming here like crazy. If uh, anyone is in Dallas, they know what's going on with this weather. I'm not gonna get home in this. So yeah, no. The, I just, it, does it ever do anything else in Texas? Oh no, it was just here. <laughs> it, 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 the weather was great. No, so, I. Uh, you know, I like Jeff. I I I would if somebody said I'm, I'm taking your fair and gone run away I, I've, I've got to make a living I would still continue to sleep uh, practice sleep I'd probably shoot the guy on the way out but because I'm in Texas <laughs> but I would I would probably still practice but like Jeff said I wouldn't be as efficient I wouldn't be as productive I wouldn't have as many patient reviews uh, I just I dare you to go to sleep Dallas and look at our reviews and see what people are saying about the technology we use it's pretty amazing mm -hmm. It absolutely is. And, and I mean, being in your new office too, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's state of the art. That's, it's absolutely, you know, I've, I've been in a few hundred dental sleep practices around the, around the country and uh, uh, what's where you're at now at that, you know, your new place in, in Frisco is, is the best of the best, man. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Thanks. Um, so Thank you all very much. I know we ran a few minutes over. Thank you very much for joining. I saw Faustina did post some link that gets to a landing page that you can submit some info. And uh, you know, if you want to have a conversation, I, mean, I, I saw a lot of people posting in the chat. Rebecca posted her personal contact info in the chat. Uh, you know, she's our director of education and uh, just an absolute phenomenal resource uh, for dental sleep medicine knowledge. So uh, the, the whole team is posted in there. The link there to the, the website, pop your info in there. Somebody will follow up. We can schedule a call, maybe schedule a visit to your office, see if this makes sense for you. Uh, everybody's in a different spot in their dental sleep practice. Some of you need to know how to optimize and, and take it to the next level. Some of you are just starting and, you know, there is no dental sleep practice. And, and Regardless, we can we can certainly help and give you some direction there because it's a lot more, especially for you just getting started. It's a lot more than just this equipment. This is one piece of a very comprehensive puzzle that needs to be solved. Uh, so we can help you with that. Um, that's it. It's Tuesday night. It's 9.07. Thank you all very, very much for joining us. And and Jeff and Ken, I I, I appreciate you guys a lot. I, I know you. You know, you took a lot of time out tonight to, to be on with us, and, and I'm grateful for that. Happy to do Always it. Always fun hanging. Yeah. This is the first time I've done a webinar with Jeff, and I didn't have a bourbon in my hand. So this is good. This is new. Mine's at home. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. All right, guys. Good night.